Welcome to Christine's Corner. I have here with me this morning, Michelle Smith from JA Nursing, and she's going to tell us how to be head literate. Welcome to the studios, Michelle. Thank you, Christine, for having me, and I'm excited to be able to share with your audience how to be health literate in our Toronto community. So as Christine introduced myself, my name is Michelle Smith. I am the owner and founder of JA Nursing, which is a community division of JA Smith Consulting and Nursing Services. So, Michelle, tell us um, a little about yourself, your profession, your um, what else you're involved in besides being a nurse. What other aspects of healthcare that you're involved in? Okay, so I've been a registered member with the College of Nurses since 2002, and since then I have worked in various areas uh, throughout our city, being a acute care setting. I've worked in nursing homes, I've worked in rehab, I've worked in the community, and quite recently, uh, within the last four years, I've ventured out into entrepreneurship and I am what you would call a business nurse slash healthcare and social advocate in our Toronto community. Um, a lot of my work in, in the city, or I call it in Toronto streets, involves a, a lot of uh, community engagement. I work with youths and I, um, I help run programs for mental health and different um, activities that require my attention. Uh, what prompted you to venture out into this arena, that other area of health? Well, you know, um, I, I have a blog, and in that blog, I've, I've disclosed that in 2002, I lost my sister to cancer. And at that particular point in time, I had a lot of answers from our healthcare system. And I figured to myself, you know, it's very hard to be working for a profession and not kindly understand all that is involved in our healthcare system. So in 2011, I said, you know, I think it's time. I've uh, done a little over 10 years, and I, and I said, I want to um, figure out how I can change outcomes for individuals. And I, I struggled with my title for a bit, and I, I sat down and I said, you know, I think this role is one of a healthcare advocate. And um, that, for me, has been um, one of my passions along the years of nursing, but more so now reaching out into the community and making it known that my goal is to make sure that our individuals in the community are health and socially literate. I quite um, support you in that area of advocacy yes. because I too myself as a nurse too, yeah. sometimes you, I have to hold back. Should I speak? Should I not speak? Would I be treading on toes? Yes. You know. But there comes a time when you just have to say, take the bull by the horns. That's right. And, 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 and go for it. It's the truth. So tell us how, how you are teaching us, you know, to be health literate. Okay, well, first and foremost, people don't understand um, with this health care system that we have, it starts primarily with the individual. And I'm, I strongly believe that um, I will be the person to de dictate my care. And in saying that, I, I would like everybody to understand that, you know, we're across the border from the states, and we've been we've been known to have the best healthcare system in the world. Yes. However, it really requires somebody helping our community navigate through the system in order to make our system be the best. So, in saying that, in the states, they have the role of healthcare advocates, and that healthcare advocate helps you from your day one symptom all the way to recovery and or proper management. So my goal is to basically do the same thing. And it would start by having um, our community and the individuals in the community understand what it is they're asking from their doctor. I expect that uh, during my, I, my have a expert patient workshop and I let my clients know that my um, health assessment, or my annual physical, which is just a fancy term for being able to build the government, a lot of money for that one visit. And it shouldn't be the same as yours. Our family history uh, is something that takes a primary role and focus in regards to getting the best health care in the system because people don't understand that in order for our doctors to order these diagnostic tests, we have to have a reason. That's correct. Mm -hmm. 
the government has mandated that the physician is not allowed to order a diagnostic test unless it is going to take away illness or if it's going to diagnose illness. That means that that preventative feature doesn't exist. So if the preventative measure doesn't exist, individuals have to be certain of what they're looking for. This is done primarily by me advocating for a client and saying that you have to be aware of your body. You have to be aware of your symptoms. And most importantly, what I say to my patients that are not quite aware of what you're feeling because sometimes disease has no symptoms. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these diseases that are out there, from hypertension being one that has been dubbed the silent killer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, bearing that in mind, we have people that are having strokes before they're having diagnoses of high blood pressure, right? And that's a very telltale sign of the lack of knowledge that a lot of people have. So I like to say to people, hey, listen, you're going to your doctor this week? Let him know that you have a family history. I have a family history of high blood pressure. I have a family history of diabetes. It's been known that in particular cultures, there are certain illness, chronic illness, that uh, people are predisposed to. West Indian culture, we are primarily predisposed to uh, hypertension, diabetes, and prostate cancer. And these are three of the major ones in our West Indian culture. Adding that to having a family history of diabetes, prostate cancer, or hypertension, your risk factors of having that disease is very, much is very high. high. But that alone should be your standing leg to go to your physician and say, I have family history of diabetes, what can I do? But I tell them what to do. I let them know, you're going to your doctor, let him know that you want to have an H1C test. He says, well, I, we're already doing a fasting blood sugar. And I said, you know, fasting blood sugar sometimes is not accurate. And um, depending if you've cheated mm -hmm. your medical by fasting for 15 hours, for example, you might go in and your blood sugar might be perfect. Right. But it's not true. true. Mm -hmm. So I tell clients that, especially if you have the history of diabetes, to ask for this A1C test. And what this test actually does is it measures the hemoglobin and the sugar in the hemoglobin over a three-month period, which gives a doctor a different analysis of your true diabetic status and or progress. Because, you know, if a patient has been newly diagnosed with diabetes, then they do this test every three months or so to see whether or not the medications are correct. Uh, another one of the helpful tips that I like to give them is in regards to blood pressure. You know, it's one of the trending topics. Uh, February is uh, the Heart and Stroke Foundation Month. And we are, you know, looking out and making sure that people are heart aware. Uh, what can we do for that, people ask. Well, if you've been diagnosed with high blood pressure, I always say to a patient, you know, how long have you been this, having taking this medication, for example? I've been on it for f five years. Oh, wow. Do you know what your high, do you know what your uh, blood pressure is? The answer will always be no. Um, a second part of my business is I'm a, I'm a mobile paramedical examiner. So I do the underwriting for insurance companies. And um, I'm the nurse that comes out to your house when you're applying for life insurance and I ask you that family history. And more than likely, the majority of the clients that I do see, they have been taking, uh, you know, 2.5 of Ramapil for the last five years, and they don't know what their blood pressure is. So my, I, my exercise and my task for them is three or four times a week on your way home, stop at Shoppers, stop at the Metro, stop at No Frills, take your blood pressure, write it down, and this is the only way you have proof when you go to your doctor, because on some days you'll go and your blood pressure might just be fine. No, not knowing. The, pr the blood pressure um, result. That's right. Is it, is it because they're not asking or they were told and forget? A lot of times um, I find that individuals don't even know what they're asking. Oh. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you were to understand that 
you're, when you're taking your blood pressure, you have a diastolic and you have a systolic. And you need to know that your diastolic should be 120 to be really great, mm -hmm. and your systolic should be 80, then you know. Right. But if you've never gotten that information or you haven't retained that information, you know, you might not remember. Um, one of the terminologies, quite frankly, with a lot of healthcare professionals is saying to a patient, your blood pressure is fine. Now, that what fine, does fine means. what does fine mean? <laughs> like, if you're um, of West Indian background, if you have 140 over 90, the doctor will tell you you're fine. Well, <laughs> um, that could be normal for a high potential person, PER. Yes. No, not low, but high. Yes. That could be their normal. Yes. But preferably, right. we would like to have it a little lower than that. We would, yes. or I need to know what is my normal. Yes. Right? So, for example, if you were consistently uh, at 140 over 80, then we've established that this is your, your normal. normal. Yes. And, you know, you might go to the, you know, shoppers and you're seeing uh, 150 over 90, and now you, you, you should start to think about something. Right. Because I know now that my normal is 150 over 90. So the goal is really to have people understand how to manage their illness, right? Because hypertension, um, you know, all we have implemented uh, naturopaths and homeopaths and, uh, you know, different remedies and smoothies and, you know, which, of which I do help my clients with endeavoring into all these different areas of care. But quite frankly, my goal is to make sure that you understand your problem. That's correct. Sometimes when you say to a patient, um, you need to exercise. They think, well, they have to go to a gym and use a stair master and stuff like that. You may have three flights of stairs in your house or apartment building the stairs. Yes. You can walk up and down that stairs, That's you right. know, That's for right. 10 minutes. That's right. That's the gym. That is the gym. Yes. Well, the thing about it is that, you know, the wellness profession has, has certainly taken a toll in our, uh, in our community. Um, and you know, all around the world, the wellness professionals, mm -hmm. and those are the people that I call the, um, they, they may turn us into fake believers. And uh, you know, I say that because, and uh, with all intention purposes, I say that because, you know, uh, your doctor might tell you to go to the gym and then you start going to the gym and you forget to go to the doctor. Because you think the gym Because is now you're kill. at the gym. Yes. And now you say, you say I, I'm going to the gym, there's nothing wrong with me. Mm -hmm. But I try to work in conjunction with uh, fitness and wellness professionals and saying, listen, the gym is one aspect and it's very important, but you can't fight family history, history. and you can't fight your genetics. And I think in all fairness, our, your, your clients should understand and be literate about what it is for them to have good health. And fitness is certainly one part of it. We all know your nutrition is one part of it. But, but by all the shadow of a doubt, your health care is at the top of my list. It's priority. It's priority. It's I mean, you know, a lot of our, our, our health and wellness professionals, um, you know, they have these organizations. And every couple of years, they have a turnover in their fitness instructors, right? And, you know, the longevity of um, somebody going to the gym is you know, maybe five to ten years, if that. Um, however, an individual has to stay in their body yes. as forever long as it lasts. And during each stage of a person's life, they have to understand that there is uh, some health concerns and issues that they very well can be predisposed to. Too, that's correct. And also knowing that um, health for one person person's state of health for each person is different. It is. And, and what we need to do with the exercise and the nutrition is, is maintaining uh, health to our optimum. Yes. Not mine's to yours or yours to mine. That's right. Based on, again, family history. That's right. What we were born with, what we inherit. That's right. And, and these are some of the, I think, um, is where sometimes the idea of health is, 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 is not... It's misconstrued. misconstrued. Yeah. It's misconstrued. And I mean, for me, I say that health, for me, really includes having that understanding of what I need. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, God forbid um, you uh, got into a car accident mm -hmm. and you take away fitness. What will happen to that person? I tell all my fitness instructors the same question. I say, listen, any one of these clients could be leaving your gym today 
and get into an accident, what will happen? What could you even do for them? Because now your job is no longer needed. So my role is to make sure that everybody that's in health and wellness understand that if you want the best results for your client, you need to access myself, a healthcare advocate, to really help your clients get the best care. Um, how do people reach you? Well, most recently I've uh, started my uh, a website and it's www.janursingservices.com mm -hmm. and I have a blog and it's, it's called JA Nursing in Toronto Streets and the reason why I, I named it that is I realized that you know I'm in Toronto and I'm searching through these streets to find a lot of answers for people. Mm -hmm. um, you know we have different types of systems in place in our healthcare system um, that at any given time once you go to the hospital you can predominantly go through each stage and um, you need to understand first of all that when you uh, ideally go into a hospital that is what we consider our acute care setting and that is where you will get uh, possibly a diagnosis of an illness and you'll be treated there until that acute phase is over mm -hmm. and then you'll be either sent home or not. Right. So for example, patients who've had a stroke in our, in, our, in our city, you know, you would start off with being in the hospital in acute care setting. Then after that, generally what happens when something goes wrong? And I, I mention this a lot because I'm finding that a lot of my clients that I'm dealing with are uh, individuals who are having to manage aging parents. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that stress of not knowing where the answers is can be quite tragic when you have a family member, a mother or a father who's just suffered a stroke. So individuals need to understand that after you pass through your acute care stage and once you become a patient, inpatient of the hospital, ultimately where you go is the decision of that facility. So a lot of times people are thinking, oh yeah, I get sick and I'll go home. It doesn't work that way. There's a lot of rules and regulations to whether or not you can go home or not when you have a stroke um, or when you have a chronic illness. And first of, that, first of all, you have to be able to prove that you'll be safe and that you have people that can take care of you. And the state of mind That's as right. well. Yeah. Have to be prepared for to deal with that illness. Exactly. So, Michelle, so in your um, experience, do you, the families of these patients, do they know what to do? You know, quite, quite often, um, you know, the whole uh, act of uh, um, um, a uh, illness, and a lot of times an unexpected illness, mm -hmm. um, because of an unexpected illness, a lot of times the family members are not aware. And really my role is to be able to help a family get through this whole system. So a person could contact me and I would come out and I can help them um, navigate the system, um, get the appropriate resources that they need. Because a lot of times when you're going home, you can require an occupational uh, health, physiotherapy, uh, maybe you can need med medicine management, you, may, you might need to know um, what signs and symptoms is happening for me to contact my physician and also you, you just really need to know how to now restart my life mm -hmm. with this new illness. Right. And a lot of times one of the big ones is, I find is diabetes. Mm -hmm. It's one of the absolutely most mm -hmm. um, frustrating diseases for people to get a handle of because traditionally the paperwork that's out there is very standard. And if you're from a culturally diverse background like a West Indian background or an East Indian background, even an Asian background, a lot of the standard protocol does not work. And you find these people are coming back again. So what my services does is it really helps the individual tailor their care to what they need. And so can you tell us um, why is it that it's not working? Is it because of, is it because of culture or is it because of, of how it's written? It's primarily because of culture. Mm -hmm. 
diabe you know, diabetics, they say you're supposed to eat five times a day, five small meals, I have two snacks in the middle, uh, check your blood sugar Monday uh, in the morning, at lunch, and at supper. Well, they also forgot to tell the patient that the lancets are not covered. Yeah, that's right. Right? And that costs money. And that costs money. So, I mean, for myself, I call myself a health and social advocate because I really take into an account the fact that when you're suffering from a chronic illness, mm -hmm. there's also a lot of social barriers yes. that may be Im implemented and preventing them from maximizing and getting the best results, right? Or you might ask this patient to, um, they need to eat this time of the day, but they have four children at home. They might be on social assistance and they might very well be marginalized. Mm -hmm. How do you help them? So, you know, my goal is to continue to spread the word and continue to help our community be literate by really giving them the access, the information to where to go to get the right access and the right outcomes. So, um, you know, you had asked me before, how do people find me? You know, I have a my website, I said, or uh, somebody can simply email me at janursingservices mm -hmm. at gmail.com. I do a free consultation. Uh -huh. And in that free consultation, a lot of times the information that I give you might very well be enough for you to carry on because I would like people to understand that we're moving into a trend where we will have no family physicians for me or you. And in saying that, will we stop going to the doctor? No. But this we is why we have to be health literate. We have to be so health we, literate. If it's a clinic that we have to go to, when we get in there, we can give us, give our history at the snap of a finger. The snap we of can a finger. Our whole history. What it is. And then we know what how to, to do. treat us. Yeah. I have a blog that I did, and and it's, and, and it's called Questions. Mm -hmm. And it's very important for patients to know what are the questions that I'm asking. A lot of times when you go inside your uh, doctor's office and you say to him, you know, I don't know what's wrong. You're like saying to him, you don't know what's wrong either. Because he doesn't know either. Because you don't know either. Because we need to tell him some kind we of symptom. We need sentence. to tell him a symptom, and yeah. exactly. Uh -huh. So, you know, I always like to tell people yeah. directly the questions that they are supposed to ask. And by a shadow of a doubt, every healthcare professional all over the place mm -hmm. is responsible to answer a question uh -huh. once a question is asked. So I think uh, that would be one of my biggest, biggest lessons for your viewers today is that you have to remember to ask a question in order to get an answer. And I'm here to help your viewers, your listeners, and our community formulate the right questions. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. This is quite a mouthful of information. Yes. And I'm so glad you are there. And hopefully there'll be more like you because Thank you know you. one person can't do it all. No. So no. viewers, there you have it. Take control of your health. Ask the right questions. Tell your doctor. Know what is wrong. The symptoms you feel. Because it's better to prevention is better than cure. Thank you for being here today. Thank you very much for having me. Mm-hmm.